With anti-establishment nationalist politicians on the rise on both sides of the Atlantic, I'll ask a panel of experts whether we're entering a new and dangerous era of right-wing populism. An upfront special. Across the globe, and especially across the West, right-wing populists are riding high. First they won the Brexit referendum in the UK, and then the presidential election in the US. Soon they could have the French presidency too. So is this a populist moment? Are we witnessing the dawn of a new nationalist or authoritarian era? And if so, how worried should we be? The Pope recently said he was concerned that a wave of populist movements could produce a new Hitler. Joining me to discuss this are Ruth Ben-Ghiat, professor of history at New York University and an expert on fascist and authoritarian regimes, Shadi Hamid, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., and author of the recent book, Islamic Exceptionalism. From Paris, we have Martin Canse, fellow at the Paris office of the German Marshall Fund. His focus is on transatlantic relations and French politics. And from Jerusalem, we're joined by Anshel Pfeffer, who writes about global affairs for Haaretz and for The Economist. He's covered everything from Brexit and the far right in Europe to the far right in Israel. Thank you all for joining me on this upfront special. Um, Ruth, I want to start with you. Are we living in a new era? Is this a populist moment? And if so, what's driving it in your view? I think we're definitely living in a new era. We're also being fed a series of crisis narratives by the new right, which would like us to uh, be in a new era where everything is decaying and they are the answer, they are the saviors. As to what's driving it, there's a sense of disaffection with existing party structures, a sense of the weakness of the left, inability to deliver on globalization, and a yearning for a strong leader in some cases, as well as a lot of kind of atavistic fears set off by the migrant crisis. Anshul, you've been covering, uh, reporting on populist movements across the globe. How new is this in your reporting, in your journalistic experience? Well, I think this word that we're using nowadays of populism and populist movements, I mean, it's an accurate description, but it's also a different name for something which we've been talking about quite a while, which is identity politics. I mean, what is, what, what is, what does a populist leader or a populist movement do in a country? It basically creates these borders between identities. It's, it's an us versus them, us, the hardworking, honest, patriotic citizens of sons and daughters of the country versus them, the the blood-sucking elites who were actually basically aliens. And we've, this has always been part of modern politics. It's not, it's not a new phenomenon. But what we're seeing now, the way it's being used in a much more amplified way over the various modern ways that we have now of communications, especially social media, takes this to a much more, much more populist, to use, the, to use the term, much more populist form of politics than we had in the past. Uh, Shadi, as you've watched events in the UK, Brexit, what's happening in France with Marine Le Pen's rise, and of course in the United States with Donald Trump. What's gone through your head? So it sort of reminds me of the Middle East <laughs> in that, um, and you know, early on I remember listening to one of Trump's uh, kind of rallies and thinking to myself, he has a very hypnotic way of speaking. We might hate what he says, but there is a charisma that we have to acknowledge. And he taps into the worst aspects or the dark, let's say the darker aspects of the human psyche. And that's something that Arab autocrats or various Islamist groups in the Middle East have been doing for a long time. They understand that people want something more than your kind of run-of-the-mill technocratic politics. And I wanted Hillary Clinton to win, but let's be honest, she wasn't very inspiring or exciting. She didn't speak to this desire to be part of something meaningful. So I think what these different groups do, whether it's Trump or far-right populists in Europe or Islamist groups, is they speak to this human desire. But why now? Why is this human desire in 2016, 2017? Well, it's always been there, I think, mm. underneath the surface. But I think 
I think that a lot of this has to do with various modern trends. I mean, the rise of social media and t um, technology and this kind of cross-pollination between countries where Trump is meeting with leaders of the uh, far right in Britain or Austria. But I think it's also that, you know, over the last few decades, um, we sort of hit, I think, a wall in the sense of what this center-left or center-right politics can really offer. And obviously, there's also been an economic recession. So you put those different aspects together, and I mm. think you have a perfect storm. Well, picking up on the perfect storm, Martin can say in Paris, um, the reason we're all talking about populism is because of what happened in 2016 in the UK with Brexit and in the United States with Donald Trump's win in November. We're now in 2017, and attention is now on France, where there's going to be a presidential election, uh, where Marine Le Pen of the National Front is riding high. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, Geert Wilders' party is said to do uh, very well there, could become the largest single party. Why has continental Europe now suddenly looking like ground zero for this populist moment? What is it about the Europeans? Well, I, I would actually be very cautious not to um, link all these different elections and, and make it look like if it, there is a pattern that would necessarily lead us to have Le Pen being elected or have a, a populist uh, leader in, in the Netherlands. I think there are some uh, similarities between these different countries, but generally speaking, we have to take into account the national singularities. And, and in the case of France, I hear a lot of, of people, both in the UK and in the US, kind of predicting that Marine Le Pen would win, uh, that we are already kind of blind and, and not able to, to see it coming. I, I would be very, very prudent. I would say, however, that there is definitely this feeling that there is no, we need to repoliticize the debates, that there are elections, but there is no choice. There's kind of consensual, uh, central uh, right, central left politics that does not deliver, that actually technocracy is anti-democratic and that the populist leaders, that is the great irony, the populist leaders are the real ones who care about uh, freedom of, of expression and democracy. And that is, I think, the danger. Anshar, do you agree with Martin uh, that we should be wary before drawing connections between what's happening in Britain with Brexit, US with Trump, France with Le Pen, the Netherlands with Wilders? and then we'll come to the rest of the world, but just those, those cases in particular. I totally agree with Martin because basically what we're seeing in this rise of populism is not just a right-wing phenomenon. I mean, there are many elements in the, Corbyn, in the Corbynista camp in, in the UK which use very similar kinds of populism. Parts of the Bernie Sanders phenomena, there was a lot of populism there. You can go in to, 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 uh, to parts of Europe. Uh, Beppe Grillo in Italy, he's certainly not a right-winger. Syriza in Greece. Populism is not just a right-wing phenomena. It's a way of doing politics. It's a way of engaging with, with an audience and with a public which is not necessarily far left left, far right, it, 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 could be, it could be either side. So, so these connections are very, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a bit superficial to say this is just a right wing thing, especially as you see the uber populist Vladimir Putin in Russia, it, he, he goes it both ways. He engages with the far left and the far right as well. Ruth. Yeah, but something is happening uh, about drawing the connections and making networks that's going on, which is very disturbing. And to me, as a historian, reminds me very much of what happened in the late 1930s with the Axis, where you see uh, the reason, for example, Steve Bannon was brought into the Trump administration is for his Breitbart media, which is beginning to spread with European editions. You have a lot of meetings going on, Marine Le Pen, and people coming to Putin, people coming to Trump. And there's an attempt to kind of set up this network of accords and and kind of like-minded meetings and, and a propaganda When you, when you say like-minded meetings, what is connecting? What do, they, what do they think, these parties and leaders think connects them? They think, uh, they think what connects them is they have a vision of the future. And I wanted to put the accent on the sense of this, this kind of crisis narratives, but also the accent on freedom. When Marine Le Pen said Brexit was an act of courage, it's a freedom for people. You see a lot of the word, use of the word freedom in the Netherlands, in Austria, in the titles of parties. And it's this kind of freedom you know, from government interference, freedom from uh, invasion of non-whites. 
So you have all of that going on, and there are these conscious attempts to make these connections now. And so even if we don't want to lump them all together, we have to realize that there is this kind of process going on. Shadi. I mean, there's something, there's something else that's different today. I mean, we're, we're living in the post-9-11 era. We're living in the age of ISIS. And we're seeing the rise of Muslim immigration. So we see growing Muslim populations in many of the countries we've mentioned, whether it's France, Britain, or the Netherlands. And I think what's interesting, and Anshul's exactly right, that some are, some are more left-wing populist, some are right-wing. Um, one leader of Italy's Northern League described his party as libertarian but also socialist. What the heck does that mean? But the, the thread that ties these different groups together is a fear of Islam and Muslims. Mm. And almost without exception, which I think is a, a really interesting feature, and they see Islam as a civilizational threat, and they define themselves in opposition to that other. How much of this, and I'm asking all of you guys, but starting with Shadi, how much of this is driven uh, by quote unquote identity politics, by this idea of the other immigrants Islam, Muslim, civilizational challenges, and how much of it is driven by economics, by the idea that these are the left behind of globalization, these are the losers from free trade. Wh which of those trends do you think is really driving this? I think one problem we have in this debate is we try to say, well, it's one or the other. It's either racism or economics when it's a mix, and the two reinforce each other, right? But I, but I think one thing you There's see... There's not a natural link between being left behind by globalization and seeing Islam as the biggest threat to your way. No, I mean... There's not, I mean, the there's not more, an automatic link between well, them. The more you feel you're left behind, the more you're going to try to find scapegoats. Yeah. The more you're going to ask yourself, well, all these Muslim immigrants and refugees who are coming in, are they going to take away my jobs? And when things aren't going well in your own life, then you find refuge, let's say, in identity, ideology, or religion. So I think the two go, do go together. And I think it's especially an issue in countries that are quite secular in Europe that have a strong identity of keeping religion outside of the public sphere. So you have Muslim immigrants coming in and holding on to some of their traditions well, or religious practices. Well, let's, see, let's see if Martin agrees with you. He's sitting in perhaps the most quote unquote secular country in Europe. <laughs> Yes, well, I, I would say that actually both identity politics and the economic crisis have fueled this phenomenon, but they are not the roots of it. Uh, I would say that the root of it and what basically connects all these parties together is this feeling of deconnection between part of the population and quote unquote the elite. This is something that's quite common all around uh, continental Europe. And, and, and this is more about, it's not about the crisis of democracy, it's not about I don't want to participate, but it's more about I want to bypass uh, the traditional parties, I want to bypass the elite and, and talk directly to the decision makers. So it can take a, a form of, of a referendum, that's, that's the strategy of the Front National in France, having a referendum more or less for every law, and, and, and can be uh, with a form of, of Twitter and, and, and social media. So in, in other countries. So uh, in my, my opinion, and definitely in the case of France, they, they have economic and identity politics have participated in the phenomenon, but they are not uh, really the explanatory okay. factor. I want to jump in uh, about the issue of communication that Martin raised. It cannot be overstated how important this kind of direct bond with the people is, whether you have a charismatic leader like Trump, uh, the use of Twitter, this kind of sense that with communication you're bypassing mainstream media, you're bypassing uh, mastodontic party structures. And the mainstream media is a big bogeyman for yes, populist movements. Yes, it should go between scare quotes. Um, and I, you know, when Trump started tweeting, um, and he would tweet at 3 a.m. at 3 p.m., it really, it really was very affecting and moving to many of his supporters who felt like he was there for them at all hours of the day and night. And it made this scripted, um, you know, we have these two huge parties in the United States with these kind of, you know, old-fashioned bureaucratic communication structures. And it made them look very behind the times. And, and through them, uh, through this way, Trump was able to forge a kind of authoritarian bond that's very charismatic in nature. And once those bonds are formed, they're very difficult to break. Uh, Shadi, you've written about illiberal democracy and the, and the threat of illiberal democracy, the concern around it. What do you mean by that? Explain what the worry is and what is illiberal democracy. So illiberal Democrats are those who believe in the democratic process. They come to power through democratic means, 
but they're illiberal in the sense that they're, they don't really believe as much in personal rights and freedoms and civil liberties, protections for minority rights. So there is the tension. So liberalism and democracy don't necessarily go together. But from my standpoint, um, respecting democratic outcomes is pretty critical. So I've been quite outsp outspoken against the not my president hashtag thing in the or US, in the US or trying to get the electoral college in the US to overturn mm. a democratic outcome. Donald Trump was legitimately and democratically elected through our existing rules regardless of whether we like them or not. So he is, I'm afraid to say, um, my and our but president, and we have to you. respect if that. If you view Donald Trump, as some do, not just as illegi illegitimate, but say a fascist or a neo-fascist, and if you therefore start going back to history, Ruth mentioned this reminding of the 1930s, I think the Pope recently said, look what populism gave us in the past, I'm worried about another Hitler, then, then where does that leave you in terms of legitimacy and accepting some of these parties yeah, and rules? The problem is, this, the scariest thing is that these people don't need to transform their states into a one-party dictatorship. And I'm an expert on fascism, and I have not called Donald Trump a fascist because I want to respect that difference. He's an authoritarian. But what happens is they're able to stretch the boundaries of democracy uh, to, to something unrecognizable, but it's not a, it's not a di fascist regime. Mm. And, and the, the danger is also this kind of uh, process of intimidation of citizens, which we're seeing very heavily in the first days of Trump's rule, where people are afraid to speak out and the boundaries are pushed uh, to what can be said and the kind of tolerance for violence and rhetorical or actual. And you find yourself with a, a state that is transformed uh, out of all recognition, but it's still, quote, democracy. And how does the media cope with this phenomenon? I'm going to come to Angela in a second, but Martin, to you first. We talked about the media being a bogeyman for some of these populist movements. How does the media tackle the likes of Trump, Le Pen, well, I think that's, that's, that's the point. The media don't know how to do uh, with, with this kind of, of uh, characters because what's, what is usually do, done is, is to criticize them for being this neo-fascist or, or this new authoritative uh, figures. It doesn't impact their popularity. Uh, it actually doesn't help. And it, it, it will rather participate in, in the feeling that these uh, politicians are the real anti-system, which is what the, the most of the people that are voting for them want. So the media uh, can only give new arguments by kind of creating this war on populism and, and, and cr make basically confirm the idea that there is an elite versus uh, some courageous anti-system uh, parties. Ancho. I think the media is beginning to pay the price for uh, being too much uh, infotainment over the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, the media was, uh, you know, has, has allowed itself to become dumbed down, has felt this need to fill in so many hours of broadcasts on 24-hour on cable, uh, channels and on the internet to fill so so much space that it, uh, the media has diluted itself and become very much obsessed with celebrity, obsessed with PR, obsessed with with Hollywood and everything around it, and much less focused on what the media was what journalism was supposed to do, uh, which was supposed to speak truth to power, and it allowed itself to you know to be to be captive to, to be, be captivated by these bigger than life so-called bigger than life uh, people like Donald. I mean, Donald Trump basically w was just waiting to come along for this moment in the media when the media just needs a, a good story to tell rather than actually looking for the facts. Trump is tr Trump would not have been elected pr uh, president in, a, in another media period. And now the media is finally having to look at itself in the mirror and say, w how did we create a different uh, journalistic lands landscape which allowed this? Ruth is saying that's not true. Come in, Ruth, and then Ancho. Because uh, then if you Chani. look at the history of the media, but you, you had Mussolini who came in and there was no TV, and he, he's a very good precedent in his time because he was a journalist, he was a master of slogans, of rallies, and he learned about moving images as being very effective. So his Twitter was, was newsreels and, and movies. But you have a similar thing where it, there are times in history where you have these forces and these anxieties, and then a, a charismatic person can come and coalesce these things and lead everybody and, 
and get a form of consensus, and that's what we've got now with Trump. And a lot of people look at the populist movement and say, why can't the left do populism the way right do? The same distrust of bankers, the same distrust of the media, the same anger at globalization should also, in theory, fuel left-wing well, parties. Think, and it hasn't really. Syriza in Greece, maybe. Bernie Sanders had his moment in the US. I but think in general, is a good the right are winning this. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is a good, a good example of this. And I think that um, my disagreements with him aside, I think that his model of tapping into that anger is a model that should be uh, followed closely. And that was a real contrast with Hillary Clinton. As much as Hillary Clinton used populist rhetoric, it was never convincing because you knew that deep down she didn't feel it. Do you think in the current moment, if you're not fighting populists, right-wing populists, with equal ang equally angry left-wing populism, the right-wing populist will win? I think that's part of it, but you can, you can be angry but still be smart. You can be angry and still base your anger on facts. The two aren't mutually exclusive. And sure, you raised this point at the start of the show that you know populism is left and right, and yet, wherever we look, it's the right that seems to be doing it better and winning off the back of it. Why is the left so bad at populism in the West? Because there, we're talking here about two different kinds of populism. Yeah. There's the populism which comes along with the politics of hate, with, a, with the nasty side of identity politics. And that is a lot of what we're seeing on the, in these right-wing movements. And I think there's also some nasty sides. There were some nasty parts in the, in the Sanders, you know, the Bernie bros, and there's some nasty streaks in the Corbynista camp. And we can see it in other parts of the world. So it's not necessarily nasty, it's just on the right wing. But it is more effective for the right wing, because the right wing have all these patriotism, blood and soil kind of narratives, which have always lent themselves to a certain kind of populism. But I'd like to make, make, make one point here about what Shadi said, because Shadi is very right. There has to be a way of linking to the anger and to the feelings of people. And it may be... A it, it, it's another form of populism. It's a more benign form of populism. It's a more positive form. Populism does not necessarily have to be like the Pope said, the thing which is going to lead to Hitler. I mean, Hitler's biggest enemy, Churchill, was a, was a po populist as well. So populism is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it, when it's married with hate and with fear, with all the phobias, that, that's when it's, it's really worrying. Ruth. Yeah. Um, Shadi is so right about harnessing the power of emotion, the power of charisma. The, the center left has to fight back with appropriating some of the things that the center right and the right has done. And I do want to say something that picks up what you, at the beginning of the program, about Hillary Clinton. You know, she did have uh, something that was bigger than all of us. It was female power. And you cannot underestimate what an inspiring thing it was to have a woman who taught, has fought her whole career for children's rights, for, for women's rights, and, yet the and majority for human of our rights. Fellow white women voted for Donald Trump. It's true, but it's a very, but it said, as you see from the women's march, it set off a whole cascade of emotion, and that's an example of something positive. But the the enormous uh, misogyny that her campaign raised is also something to be aware of, because a lot of these movements, Marine Le Pen notwithstanding, as the female leader. They are an attempt to turn the clock back and have European white Christian male privilege upheld. Let me ask you this. A lot of viewers around the world will be listening to you point out that you've studied fascism, extremism. On this show so far, you've said it reminds you of the 1930s and Mussolini's a good model. <laughs> that will worry a lot of people. If that's the case, what comes next? I think uh, I think fighting fighting back with appropriate is what I said before. You, what comes next is to find uh, appropriate ways of of making an alternate mo alternate model palatable and appealing. But before um, you get to that stage, things are going to get worse before they get better. Is what you're I, to be suggesting? I believe they will, and I have spent a lot of time writing things that are designed to make people look at what we have in front of us, that Donald Trump, for example, is an authoritarian and he cannot be combated, including by the media, with the usual rules. He's changed the rules of the game and it, that's an opportunity of, for freedom. You can change it as well uh, on Shadi, the other side. Briefly. You know, on this point, I mean, most Americans my age haven't lived under an odd under authoritarianism. They take a lot of this for granted, and understandably so. But I think what the one, a positive of the Donald Trump phenomenon is that I think now a lot of people have to look inward and they have to not take it for granted. And liberal democracy, or just democracy, or just the things that we're used to in terms of minority rights, are things that you have to fight for. 
And I think that if, if, if all of this can lead to that realization, maybe that will shake us from our complacency. And shall final word to you, are, are these populist movements going away anytime soon? Is this a, a long-term or a short-term phenomenon? Well, I think that we should always bear in mind that the same electorate which voted in Donald Trump a, a few months ago, eight years ago, voted in Barack Obama. So there's a, you know, the, the pendulum is at work here. The populist movements never went away. They were always here. But I think that we are in better shape than we were in the 1920s, 1930s to, uh, to face them. And I, I'm still optimistic about democracy. It's still... I think, as Churchill said, the least bad of, uh, of uh, the least worst of all the of all the various options, and I think that uh, the United States can survive for even eight years under Donald Trump. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you all for joining me on Upfront. I appreciate it.